How about this one for missing a nudge? I prepared the lecture in English. <laughs> it was indeed meant as a polite gesture to you, Mr. Thaler. Imagine the transport minister announcing that people will shortly be required to wear elaborate protective gear on scooters. In her motivation, she refers to new scientific evidence that shows that many nasty injuries are incurred because of a lack of protective gear and could have been avoided, thus preventing human harm, as well as saving on healthcare costs. Hence, protective gear to shield elbows, knees, backs and chest will be made obligatory. Most likely, such a call would meet with a public outcry, in particular in the Netherlands. It would be seen as patronizing, state paternalism in overdrive. It is statism which doesn't fit our day and age, I quite agree. Every week we are reminded that today's citizens tolerate only that much state intervention. Expensive national vaccination programs meant to protect citizens against health risks meet distrust and controversy. A road pricing scheme that offers a solution for traffic jams is reframed as a threat to privacy. The government struggles with persistent problems and is looking for new repertoires to be authoritative. How can it act on public problems? Now picture the following. A snowboarder. She is dressed in the casual outfit that not only marks the true snowboarder but also differentiates her from the common downhill skiers who, with their ski poles and long gliders, prefer comfort over risk. The snowboarder is cool and wants to show off. Yet, interestingly, the snowboarder is wearing a helmet. What is more, should the skier and the snowboarder meet at a restaurant on the slopes, the skier would notice that the snowboarder wears considerably more protective gear underneath her baggy garments. It's not that she acts upon scientific evidence, it's simply cool to wear it. This sort of behavioural logic is important to understand when we discuss policy making on public risks. And while the examples are interesting and intriguing, they may, in their simplicity, be profound in suggesting how the state might approach some of the major risks it is confronted with. I will single out here one of those risks, climate change. We know that the two-degree target is a way to control climate change. We know what we need to do. A worldwide stabilization of our greenhouse gas emissions before 2020 reduce our carbon emission by 50% worldwide by 2050. To do this in a way that is just, Western countries would have to ha reduce their carbon emissions with 80% by 2080, 2050. This is a tremendous challenge. In the example above, I showed that helmet, helmets come in variations, actually, there are even more variations of helmets. I'll leave them with you. It's easy to see that those who feel stimulated by Richard Stalin nudging are likely to feel less comfortable with the scooter helmet. They try to steer clear of a hierarchical form of state paternalism. Nudgers believe in a gentle, encouraging government. The label that Thaler and Sunstein have invented is that of libertarian paternalism. Whether this is an oxymoron or not, the book meets an eager public. Policymakers and intellectuals are searching for new perspectives on the state and governance. We now recognize the downside of new public management. We can no longer claim to be in the vanguard of thinking by reiterating the dichotomy between government and governance. It is obvious, after all, that governance is the way ahead, if only because we often see a mismatch between the skill of governmental jurisdictions on the one hand and that of public problems on the other. Effective ways of dealing with public problems require collaboration among a range of actors that is typical. And it is significant that these actors do not stand in a hierarchical relation to each other. Hence, collaborative governance is a requisite 
for effective government. Taylor's work in that context is an example of a broader academic literature that seeks to take the responsibility to try and find a new theory of government. Here the young traditions of behavioral economics has the same advantage, I must admit, as the new scientific field of neuropsychology. It is full of wonderful little insights into what motivates people and with why many status strategies to alter behavior do not work. Actually, reading the book, it shows it's outright contagious. There are many examples that I won't go into. But ever since I read the book, I'm looking for the stairs in buildings that seem to have the default options of an elevator. But the nicest example is that of one of our hosts, Henrietta Prost herself. When I showed in the uh, planning agency's work that meat consumption is responsible for 12% of the greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of global land use, and 30% of biodiversity loss, she called to change the default on dinner invitations. Instead of the new obligatory possibility to tick a box if one is a vegetarian, she suggested the alternative default. Yes, I do have dietary wishes. I'm a Canavorian. Is this just a cute example? Are they not in the category of pygmy solutions to the giant issue of climate change? Or otherwise, can nudging help avoid a climate catastrophe? Well, the argument is easy to denounce. All these little examples and initiatives do not add up. But perhaps there are two rebuttals. Firstly, to reach an 80% reduction, simply everything is needed. If all Dutch citizens would decide on a single day without meat consumption, we would reduce CO2 emissions by 6 to 7 uh, percent points of megatons, a full vegetarian day, so also with our dairy products, would constitute 0.5 of the Dutch greenhouse gas emissions. So 0.5 by one day of a different diet. 3.5, therefore, if you would be a vegetarian for a whole week. And if we reflect on the little action that is needed, there's actually a stunningly big contribution. And secondly, nurturing signals a social power that may contribute more than just a direct percentage effect. I think climate change can only be limited if the state succeeds in making this into a cultural force, something to which a large group in society feels attracted. Now here's a reminder. Strong environmental policies have always been accompanied by a social movement. In the famous works of Donald Worcester or Samuel P. Hayes, you see that there is always a movement that together with all sort of state elite activity have produced the sea of change. The wilderness protection and the launch of the national parks in the United States was the result of a coalition of German educated foresters, Washington based policymakers and newly urbanized population rediscovering the natural environment they had left a generation ago. The big surge of environmental awareness in the 1960s and 1970s came from concerned biologists like Rachel Carson, local movements struggling with real pollution sites, and a newly educated generation that discovered and prioritized post-material values from the comfortable position of having grown up in families where parents had devoted their lives to beefing up the material quality of their families. I think that today's climate strategies demand a similar search for kindred spirits that together can create the often unlikely coalitions that could then bring about real social change. But there are two dimensions that deserve more attention than that they get, I think, in, in nudging. Nudging, in the end, is all about individual behavior. Firstly, while it might add up, it presupposes, I think, a particular role of the state. And precisely that theory of planning, I do not find entirely convincing. And secondly, the question is if individuals have to be nudged individually, if they not together cannot become much stronger as a cultural force. The history of the environmental politics I refer to briefly seems to show that the latter is the case. 
But here, if we want to achieve that, we have to think more about framing issues. In short here, I think climate change has less potential when the move from the age, when the, 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 the frame of climate change has less potential than the move from an age of polluting fossils to an age of autonomy based on endless renewables. Key words that in an alternative discourse might have a big effect. Innovation, smart solutions, global justice, accountability and autonomy. And part of these words actually come from the Nudge vocabulary. But let me briefly dwell on the state first. I think that nation states are, and it might come as a surprise from my mouth, going to be the single most important players in guiding the energy in the right direction. However, the role of the state, I much prefer the uh, helmets actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think nation states are going to be the single most important players. However, the role of the state in this perspective is one of setting long-term goals and making fully clear that these are not open to discussion any longer. Mag ik mijn helmen terug? Dank u wel. The task of the state is to set clear limits and clear goals. It should create a level playing field both in space and time that provides the certainties and opportunities that are needed to unleash what I would like to call a creative competition. It requires judicial and institutional means we cannot do without. For me, the true power of nudging is not in the cute examples, but in the central idea of setting the defaults right. That is persuasive. All forms of organization come with a bias, as the American political scientist Schott Snyder observed in the early 1960s. Later that decade, Beckerack and Barrett famously elaborated that idea that power is embedded in non-decisions. These ideas are not now very relevant for the climate debate. Our society's default is based on the consumption of fossil fuels. In ordinary life, we take one non-decision after another with which we perpetuate a non-cool climate harming lifestyle. But states can of course choose to change defaults, set rules that made it attractive to conserve energy and to turn to renewables. It is a state, however, that defines these new priority rules. New priority rules that might, for instance, be based on a trias energetica with the highest priority for energy saving, followed by using renewables and then followed by clean fossils. Combine this with explicit commitments to CO2 reduction targets that are predictable and climate change policies might start to bite. The appropriate instrument for this, however, is a climate bill, like the UK has adopted. Because I suppose the one thing that needs to be achieved is that it is a non-partisan type of predictability that in time also provides a level playing field. Here the devil is in the details. But it's also here that nudges can be created. For instance, make citizens into producers. Give them the priority on the grid if they themselves produce renewable energy. The same would apply to businesses and firms, obviously. It's called feed-in tariffs. Secondly, decentralize goal achievement. Set your national targets and provide the incentives to compete. Allow creativity in goal achievements. And thirdly, don't discourage, don't disappoint. Nothing would be more destructive than uncertainty about prices or rules in the coming years. Nothing worse than stopping a successful scheme in introducing renewables because too many people applied. While we do not have a feed-in system yet, new figures show that individual farmers and cooperatives today already are responsible for 45% of the existing wind capacity in the Netherlands. They simply saw an opportunity. It shows actually the societal potential for achieving climate change goals. But there are two major instruments, I suppose, that can hardly rate as nudges. 
State can give this societal project a tremendous boost by internalizing, insisting on internalizing environmental costs by making fossil fuels expenses, expensive. And I think the labels you showed on the electricity, uh, door, the electricity door hangers or people having their electricity uh, bills, I mean, it starts to work if the price of electricity is higher. We do actually have these, the, these possibilities to compare yourself to your neighbors, but there's no incentive to be too concerned about it. So the single, single biggest stimulus is putting a high price on CO2 emissions and perhaps punish misuse of rules meant to prevent climate change. There are always loopholes, fix them. Secondly, the framing issue. The second addition to the nudge perspective is the framing dimension. The current frame of climate change is about 80% reduction, cap and trade, the threat of an apocalypse, coordinated policy plans, but it might not be too helpful to make this into a broader cultural force. What might help, however, is showing how pathetic a continued reliance on fossils is actually, actually is. Young people like iPods, not clumsy cassette players. And it is that young generation that will have to act. House owners like low electricity bills and cheap mobility. All people in the West like to think of themselves as autonomous choice-making individuals. You tap into that resource by framing the challenge as one of harvesting the endless resources of renewables. Show that this is a target for our uh, abstract knowledge economy, EE, our universities and firms. Set as a goal regaining autonomy and make neighborhoods, cities, firms work on their own non-carbon profile. And use as keywords clean, innovative, globally just and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, Copenhagen will stage, one way or another, the joint action of political leaders. But then climate change politics will come home. State will then have to act on their promises. And at that time, a crucial choice will have to be made. Are we going to force people to comply or are we going to change the default and allow people to readjust? It is actually a choice between helmets. I personally would go for the snowboarders. The snowboarders in my story are the cities, firms and citizens, perhaps even the neighborhoods, that start to protect themselves against the risk they fully well understand and get satisfaction out of being innovative, autonomous and accountable. If the government allows those groups to profit maximally from taking the lead, then the break, break out of the fossil era may be slightly more likely. Thank you for your attention.